All right, so I'm just gonna do a quick introduction for our panelists. And then after the film screening, each of them is gonna introduce themselves in just a little bit more detail. We've got Jay Keeney, who's Conservation Northwest Sagelands Program Lead. Again, my name is Chase Gunnell. I'm the Communications Director for Conservation Northwest. We have Michael Schroeder with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Scott Downs also with WDFW. Molly Linville, who's a Department of Fish and Wildlife Commissioner and rancher in the incredible Moses Cooley in Douglas County. Ted Gerdowski, who's the filmmaker behind this film. Um, Ted and I got to work together on a few different short films on the shrub step of central Washington and all of that ended up flowing right into this piece and really just did a fantastic, fantastic job with this film. Jordan Rickman, who's Conservation Northwest Sagelands Program Coordinator based out of Ellensburg. Jordan's gonna be facilitating the Q&A a little bit later this evening. And both Jordan and I will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A function here on Zoom, making sure that your questions get answered. And Emily Washines, who is a educator and Yakima Nation member. And again, I'm gonna ask each of these folks after the film to just expand on their biography a little bit and give you a little bit better sense of who is answering your questions about Washington Shrub Step tonight. So please stay tuned for that. Looks like we've got more than 100 people on now. And in just a minute, I'm gonna go ahead and start the film. It's about 12 minutes. And please, as you're watching it, or as you um, are listening to the panelists tonight, please feel free to put any questions or comments into the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on that. All right, so it's 6.05. I'm gonna go ahead and hit play on the film. And again, please stay tuned for the conversation afterwards. We used to just call it rangeland, where cattle ranged and wildlife ranged. Shrub step is just a little more accurate description. 99% of the species are grasses and, and wildflowers, and yet those big shrubs are what you notice first. That's why we call it shrub step. When you put yourself down at the level of that landscape, you are gonna see a forest. It's just gonna be a different type of forest from the big tall shrubs to the real small lichens. It's all integrated into this amazing landscape. It's just so hard to see when we're standing, it's you know, a few feet above it, driving by at 60 miles an hour. It's definitely not a desert. It has every component that you'd find in the highest mountains and the highest national parks in the world as far as species of wildlife, species of plants, rare and endangered plants and animals, views, how they're all intertwined together is really special out here. And so I think people are just now waking up to how special it really is. There's so much biodiversity. Big game, small game, coyotes, historically wolves. Burrowing owls. Raptors flying around doing their daily chores of trying to find something to eat. Yellow-headed blackbirds. Bald eagles, golden eagles. We have peregrine falcons. Sage grouse. The sharp-tailed grouse, pygmy rabbit. Washington ground squirrel, white-tailed jackrabbit, black-tailed jackrabbit, pronghorn. Bobcats, a fairly healthy cougar population. You also find elk. There's black bear. It's also not uncommon to see a moose meandering across the shrub step. So many reptiles and amphibians out there that are just so interesting and you won't find them anywhere else.
It's not quite like you're you know, in the big forest where it's more obvious what the, what the beauty is. It just takes some time to appreciate. We have 800 foot basalt cliffs, and at any given time of the day, those cliffs are a different color, depending on how the sunlight's striking them. Wildflowers add color to it from the pinks and yellows and reds and blues. It's an amazing amount of color. There is a long cultural history, not just white history, but Native American history. This land holds our history. Our survival has meant understanding this land and the resources and what they can offer. Since time immemorial, we have been taught that this land is a part of us. There's value out here for all kinds of uses, for bird watching, for, for wildlife itself, just for their own livelihoods, for people that use that wildlife, whether it's for hunting or photography or just enjoyment, just to see it. We've been out just exploring wildflowers this spring, and we've probably identified 60 species of wildflowers just close to our house. If people wanted to experience, you know, the shrub step, actually at night is really amazing. Because it's so hot during the day in the summertime, it actually comes alive at night. The stars are amazing. There's opportunities for biking, for horseback riding, but I just particularly like to walk <laughs> and see it from foot. Looking at the land for our food, that's gonna feed me, it's gonna feed my children. You have a connection with the people that have come before you that have gathered in that area. You have a connection with the people that are gathering alongside you. Continuing something that has been done on this land since time immemorial. I feel a lot of people's lies when I'm out in the Shrub Step community, including my own, and including, I think, maybe a, a thought to the future that we're trying to say, hey, you gotta preserve this. You gotta have this. It just can't go away. It just can't go away. It's too valuable. the fire intensity has changed in these landscapes. And so we're getting these mega fires. Historically would have been smaller fires, burning less hot, covering less acres, but more often. And now what we have is big fires happening all at once, very hot and doing a lot of damage. That damage then can not always be repaired. When a fire starts in Trub Step, if it's not put out right away, they often become 40, 50, 60,000 acre fires overnight. The shrub step that you find in Washington tends to be very fragmented. What we have tried to do is to focus on programs like converting cropland into conservation reserve program, which has resulted in the conversion of former wheat fields to something that looks and acts like shrub step, and it's supporting a lot of sage grouse. We understood that with our relationship with the resources, sometimes they needed rest, sometimes they needed management. The tribe right now utilizes what's called adaptive management with our partners. I definitely think that partnerships help. So we have partnerships with WDFW to help the different resources. That's something that the Department of Wildlife is trying to do. It's something that they're partnering with us, Conservation Northwest, because it's, it's all our goals together. Way before white settlement, there was history, and we've got a lot to learn there and think about, and maybe incorporate into what we're doing today. 
We've returned species to this land because we've elevated our elders' historical knowledge about this land. And to now see those restoration examples and these things be a part and incorporate our elders' knowledge is huge. What that's gonna result in is it's gonna be more efficient. You're gonna find things that will work because you understand the landscape and what resources worked with each other. Even though we have fragmented shrub step, we don't want to treat those areas as throwaway. We do need to protect and improve the quality of the really big patches and also do whatever we can to connect these smaller patches to the bigger patches. The more we can do to improve the quality of habitat on the big patches, the better we'll be doing for all the shrub step wildlife. It's important that we fight for it and to keep it intact. Literally anybody can be a steward of the shrub step. They often have volunteer days to clean up riparian areas, to take down old barbed wire fences that are hard on the wildlife. So I'm John Galley, a wildlife biologist with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm leading the recovery effort for the federally endangered Columbia Basin Pygmy Rabbit. Behind me is one of the uh, release areas where we are trying to reestablish a wild population. They're doing what we were hoping. They're acclimating well and they're starting to get established in this area. There's a sage grouse initiative focused on working with private landowners to help sage grouse, but also improve the quality of the habitat. The greater sage grouse in Washington are actually really struggling now. We have three populations of sage grouse in the state of Washington. The largest population with about 90% of the remaining birds is in Douglas County. They're landscape species. They need big landscapes to survive. And they're a shrub step dependent bird, which is an important part of this equation because they live on sagebrush. They eat sagebrush. They have a digestive system that makes them one of the few species that can actually eat the leaves of a plant that other species find poisonous. They're basically a very important component of that ecosystem. So when you see that ecosystem, to see sage grouse is to know that that area is functioning like it should. The land and our resources continually tell a story, and it's up to us to go out and figure out how to have a relationship with this land. It's part of our culture. It's part of what makes the West the West. You might just be amazed at how silent it is, and it's a big silence, and I think that's pretty special too. I talked with a rancher yesterday that said, when those bird watchers come out, I love to go talk to them. I love to go explain to them, you know, why those birds are there and what I know about it. That's what it's all about. We don't have this blue red thing going on. We have an appreciation of the same things. Communities, economies, wildlife, beauty, ecosystem, and it all comes together right here in Shrub Step. All right, thank you all for joining us again. And I guess now we'll kind of go into a brief introduction. Everybody can have a chance to introduce yourselves where you are videoing in from and your position. So let's go ahead and start with Ted. Hi, I'm Ted Grodowski. I'm the, uh, the director of, of the film. I worked on it uh, with uh, my uh, good friend Darren Gunkel, who is a, a producer and uh, the, the script writer for it. And I'm based here in, in uh, Seattle and uh, I love the shrub step. So it was a pleasure to make this film. Great, thanks, Ted. How about Molly? 
Hello, I'm Molly Linville, and I started out my career with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, in the Mid-Columbia River Refuge Complex, which is, um, you know, sort of the Tri-Cities area where there's the confluence of the Columbia, Snake, and Walla Walla Rivers, and that's where I fell in love with uh, Shrub Step, and I was there for about 10 years and then um, inherited a beautiful cattle ranch in Moses Cooley, which is where I'm at now. And then kind of have come full circle because now I'm a wildlife, uh, Fish and Wildlife Commissioner for WDFW. Thanks, Molly. Michael? Yes. Uh, so my name is Mike Schroeder. I uh, live in uh, Bridgeport, Washington, and that's where I'm talking from right, right now. Uh, I've worked for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as a research scientist since 1992 but I've spent about 40 years working on grouse. So that's my specialty. But the most recent part of that is working in shrub step habitats. Thanks, Mike. Scott? Good evening, Scott Downs. I work as a habitat biologist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I am currently living in Yakima, Washington. So down here in kind of the south area of the Columbia Basin. Uh, and then I, uh, about 20 years ago, I. I started in depth with uh, Shub Step, working on my master's on sage thrushers out in eastern Kittitas County. So uh, love the habitat and love that you're all here tonight to appreciate it as well. Thank you, Scott. Let's go with Emily. Uh, Chef Clowett, yeah, my name is Emily Washings. I'm a Yakima tribal member. I also teach at Yakima Valley College. Uh, I publish on the resources and the land. You can find those um, on open source case studies. Just Google my name. I am currently tuning in from the Yakima Reservation, and I'm going to keep it short because I have three kids, 12 and under, and one of them is walking around right now. Thanks for joining us, Emily. And last but not least, Jay. Uh, good evening. I'm Jay Keeney. Um, I live in Olmec, Washington. I'm the Conservation Northwest. Uh, associate, and I'm uh, the lead for our Sage Lands Heritage Program. I've been working for Conservation Northwest about 12 years, and I, prior to that, I worked for NRCS for about 32 years. So I've been working in one form or another in shove step habitat, mostly in eastern Washington, for about 42 years now. And it's a place I love and enjoy spending time in very much. Thanks, Jay. And uh, I'm Jordan Rickman. I, I work for Conservation Northwest on the Sage Lands Heritage Program. Uh, I'm here in Ellensburg, Washington, originally from Spokane. So always been in shrub step and, and it, it really is beautiful once you take the time to uh, take a look at it. So let's go ahead and start in some questions. Uh, one question I have for Ted. I mean, you're from Seattle and you came over to Central Washington to create a film on something that's, I mean, a completely different landscape. So what was that like? What was it like working on this film? Well, I wasn't a stranger to the shrub step. You know, I've been going out there um, my, the entire time that I've lived in Washington. So over the last 30 years. So it's, it's been a sanctuary, you know, you know come the, the dark time over on the wet side here, you know, come spring, uh, we, we need to dry out a little bit. So, you know, I've always gone over there to, you know, get a little sunshine, a little warm breeze, um, you, you know, come come March and April when everything uh, greens up over, over there. So um, to be asked to, to do the film was really, you know, that was a gift. It was uh, exactly what I, um, you know, couldn't have asked for a, a better assignment to come my way. So. Yeah. And I mean, you created this film in the midst of a pandemic and I mean, humongous wildfires. What was that like? Well, it, it, you know, it was it, it was a gift I, again because you, you know at, at that point in, time, in the time it was um, you know spring of 2020 we had started planning out the film before the pandemic came on, but so the full thrust of the pandemic came on at that point we didn't know what was going on everything was shut down people weren't even going outside because you know we weren't sure and, and you know how this disease was spreading at that at that point in time. Um, so, you know, being trapped inside when, when I got the opportunity to, um, you know, to when we, we found um, a, a friend, a, a, a private landowner out there who, you know, hotels, campgrounds, everything was shut down. There's no place to go. And 
it, there was a, a short window of opportunity when um, when the sage grouse were were lacking. We didn't end up making it out in time for that. But you know, when everything's blooming, when all the flowers are blooming, and you know, and, and the birds are around and everything. So we really had to go when the time was was that was there. Um, but it was it was just perfect what we what we needed. So Darren and I went out there and just really got a chance to immerse ourselves in it. And you know, he and I both just have a deep love for it. And uh, you know, it was. Um, you, you know, we, we couldn't have asked for a better a, a assignment um, in, in that way. Um, in terms of the wildfires, um, they didn't happen until September of, of that, that year. So we had already spent the majority of our time filming. We spent two solid weeks out there. And initially, when we started mapping out the project, I had envisioned that we'd only take a couple of months, you know, get in, kind of get out, wrap it up. Um, but because we were Kind of stuck in this holding pattern and then the fires happened and everything else you know it, it kind of blossomed and, and grew into the, the project that it became so it became uh, much longer than we had originally in, intended now watching it i feel like boy sure is short there was so much more material that we could have covered and i you know wish we could have uh, done a, a feature length film on it but you know maybe we'll do that down the road but the wildfires um happened um after we had done all of the preliminary um, filming. Um, the footage was um, graciously um, given to us by the Grant County Fire Department. They were the ones on site, you know, taking care of the fires. Um, um, but they also have a great love for the shrub step. So they were very helpful in, in uh, letting us use that, that, that footage. I was not out there on the front lines with the firefighters. That would have been exciting, but um, very sad at the same time. So happy to leave that to the to the professionals one thing i wanted to jump in on really quick before we get to some of the great questions that are coming in on the chat and the q a is how valuable the drone footage was for this piece ted and i and jay and a few others had started shooting drone footage on this landscape way back in like 2016 or 2017 without a real clear destination for that footage but knowing that it provided a totally different view for this expansive landscape and to see so much of that make it into the final cut and really shine a totally different light a different perspective onto the shrub step was really neat and it's something you know we will all need to be careful with how we use drones but in this landscape it really can give a different vantage for how big it is but also how fragmented it is in some places and the need for restoration and connectivity work yeah, it was really fantastic that uh, you know Chase and Jay and uh, um, and Matt, the, the drone operator, were able to get out there and, and get that that footage, you know, without even knowing where it was going to end end up. But you know, getting out there on you know some beautiful sunny days to to get that, it really really you know made made my job that much easier. Yeah. So how about does anybody want to take? Oh, Scott, go ahead. I see your hands raised. Yeah, I was just going to add a uh, big thanks to well, all of us on the screen. As as Ted was mentioning, when we first, you know, kind of sat down and started playing this film, it was February and of uh, 2020. We all know what kind of fully broke out then in March and April. And the easy thing would have been for us all just, now nah, let's scrap this for a couple of years, let's come back. And that didn't happen. I mean, all the way from, you know, us all getting together, you know, wonderful, you know, colleagues and, you know, they're on the screen as far as they were on the speakers, they're willing to us to, let's find some creative way to still get in person, get this happening in the middle of a pandemic. So this is not possible. I mean, they always say it takes a team effort. This video wouldn't even been close to what happened here if there weren't a lot of very creative, ingenuitive people that I was lucky enough to be a part of a team here. So just thank you to you all, so. You're on mute, Jordan. Well, while Jordan is on mute, I was going to go ahead and address uh, a couple of the questions that are coming in in chat. Is that all right? <laughs> Uh, one of them was, what was the land like 100 years ago and what do we want for it now? Which I think is a pretty valuable uh, and insightful question. Um, I've spent a lot of time looking at old literature, trying to figure out uh, how things have changed here. And that goes back even further than that to, to Lewis and Clark and David Douglas and other 
some of the early explorers and even some of what the Native Americans described and 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 talked about, and um, and so we do know there have been a lot of changes on the landscape, uh, and a lot of these changes have disturbed the landscape quite a bit. Um, but a hundred years ago, when this landscape was disturbed, we didn't have the uh, invasive species that we have now. So one of the challenges we have now that we didn't have 100 years ago is that when you when you disturb a landscape now, uh, things like cheatgrass and Dalmatian toad flax and, uh, and other sorts of uh, basically unwelcome plants that take over a landscape have moved, they will move in very quickly, which is one of the reasons why fires that we had last, like we had last year, which would burn hundreds of thousands of acres. Uh, that's why they're such a challenge because they, they provide more space for invasive species to move in. And so when you ask, well, what do we want for it now? Well, one of the big challenges, and there's a lot of them, but one of the big ones is how do we deal with those invasive species that, that are trying to take over this landscape? Yeah, does anybody else want to address how you personally look at invasive species and what you do in your in your work? Go ahead, Molly. Molly's yeah, on know. mute too. <laughs> we'll get Thank that figured you. out. <laughs> oh my, I should know better. Um, I wasn't going to address invasive species. Well, I, I can in my answer. Um, so, um, our ranch is over a hundred years old and it's that's the ranch behind me in my photo and I think something that um, people will find interesting is there were a lot more people on the landscape in our particular area than there are now and um, there were a lot of homesteaders and um, and and the, it's a very rich for cultural resources for so there was a lot of indigenous folks on the landscape too so it was this area um, particularly where I'm at is uh, was a very uh, busy area 100 years ago and we have photos um, for some strange reason, um, this is a family ranch, my husband's family, and um, we must have had a real photographer in the family because we have a lot of hundred year old photos, which is um, pretty exciting and interesting. And it looked on the surface very much like it does now. And um, for sure, um, the invasive species are always a challenge um, that we're working on constantly. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think um, it, I think people would be surprised at how many folks were actually out here 100 years ago. On that note, we've got at least three or four different questions about um, the fact that indigenous people have been off, too often been excluded from conversations around the management and conservation of this landscape, but that that is starting to change. And there are new collaborations with many of the First Nations that have lived in this landscape since time immemorial would anyone like to take a question about how those that that management paradigm is starting to change in areas where indigenous nations are leading the way in terms of shrub step conservation, as well as restoring of cultural values and other indigenous values that I think have for too long been neglected in this conversation? And one of, just out of example, um, One of the questions was, could you talk about the evolution in these types of partnerships with the tribes? How has this changed in how we think about the stewardship of the land? And I think there was a couple others along those lines. Well, um, I think it's something that's in progress. I don't think it's, I mean, there are a lot of plans out there that ignore the largest data set of the land. That's a fact. They don't include tribal elder knowledge. They don't include our legends about the land. They don't include our knowledge. Um, and it's, we're in, I would say we're in a pivot point of that uh, relationship and learning. And what results from when you learn and listen to our elder stories about the land is you create more efficient projects. They're more cost-effective. And you know when you have results from the land, 
you, you surprise everybody. All the scientists are surprised from different partnerships and it makes it, you know, have a really good vibe about the whole thing when you're seeing species return that you didn't see for decades. Um, I think our plant species in uh, the Yakima Valley, that's the oldest that I know of, is a 70 year absence. And that returned without seeds or without planting. And that was just a result of listening to how the elders said the land worked and working with everybody from a geomorphologist to, you know, make something happen. So um, I would, <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to look at plans and people talk about climate change and then not see any native data set in their plan. And I wanna say and call out anybody specifically, but you know, you have to ask those questions. Where is your native data set? Where is that at? If it's not in there, then it's not being inclusive and you're probably gonna have a higher cost project in the end. Yeah, that's great. And on that note, we do have another question. <clears throat> Maybe Emily, you could jump in on this one too. So what other ways can we in education connect with tribal members to share knowledge and love of shrub step and work on conservation efforts? Well, I'm a visual learner. So many students are visual learners. I think this film is great at explaining, you know, the different viewpoints and dynamics of the land and the people that, you know, live here presently and have lived here. Um, I know that Ted worked with a different conference to include this film in a conference opening. Um, you know, so that's definitely one part of it. There's different case studies out there about the land, open source uh, case studies, which means you don't have to pay a subscription to see them. Uh, that's at the Evergreen State uh, College, their native case studies. I've written one about um, the Yakima Valley land here. Um, and, you know, really just, I mean, I think we want to teach so much, especially after seeing the great footage and everything that came out. We want to teach everything, but you have to almost stop and ask your, like, whoever, if your child's in middle school or in uh, elementary school, have you learned about this type of ecosystem? Like, you just keep it really simple in the initial stages of it and just build upon it um, in layers. So growing up, how did you learn about shrub step habitat? Anybody can take a stab at this. Did you learn about shrub step habitat when you were in school or was it until after? Go ahead, Mike. So yeah, I was gonna answer a, a different question, but that's still a, a pretty pretty interesting question. I, I mean, I remember when I was uh, signing up to do a PhD and I was trying to, I wanted to work on ptarmigan because I liked the thought of being in the mountains. I ended up working in a, it was a sagebrush dominated habitat in Eastern Colorado. It was a different type of sagebrush, but right off the bat, I was kind of thrust into an environment I wasn't familiar with, but when I left, I was totally enthralled with it and how a landscape that from you know, from a, above looks so two dimensional. And then when you get into it, you realize that there's just an amazing amount of diversity out there and uh, the wildlife that depend on it that, that, that wouldn't be able to survive if that habitat didn't exist. And uh, it's just kind of, it's kind of fascinating what you can learn sometimes by accident. And, uh, and a lot of us maybe had this sort of experience, but we have a good teacher who will, will get us interested in it or not. I mean, I remember taking uh, my child out to see sage, one of my kids out to see sage grouse on a lek uh, when she was in high school. And uh, she joked about it and how early they had, to, she and her friend had to get up to go see it, but she still remembers the trip. And so, you know, I know that she didn't become a biologist, but on the other hand, I think her appreciation for it is going to be there whether she become, became a biologist or not. And that's the way a lot of this works. You have to you have to expose people to it because, you know, not everybody's going to be working in the system, but you need a lot of other people to appreciate it in order to be able to conserve it. Well, and I think this film did a really great job at really focusing on the appreciation of shrub step habitat. Go ahead, Molly. 
So I'm going to be really candid with you. Um, I uh, was raised in Lincoln County in Washington State, where uh, I'm a fifth generation Washingtonian, and we were sort of adjacent to the shrub sap. We were, um, you know, in a higher rainfall percentage, and and um, I got my first job with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I was actually running a duck hunter check station in Umatilla, Oregon, and um, I drove there. Um, you know, sort of at night when it was dark. And when I, when I woke up the next morning, I thought, oh, where in the, like, where, where am I? And I, it like that, I am in love with the shrub step now, but I'm going to tell you it, that evolved. Like I, it, I wasn't immediately um, enamored with it. And um, so sometimes it takes some time um, it's, it's a hard landscape to get to know. It's a little bit hard to love sometimes. Sometimes it feels like it's actually trying to kill you a little bit. Um, and then like I, for me, I, it evolved into just, I kind of, you know, when I, I, I live and work on this landscape every day, I'm outside every day in the shrub step. And um, I kind of feel like a badass being able to love it. And, and, and um, you know, when, when my cattle are doing well, the wildlife is doing well. And um, I, I just love it now. But I would tell folks that it's okay if it takes a little while to, to get that appreciation of it. It's, it's hard to get to know. Scott? Yeah. For me, it was, I guess, just kind of curiosity over the years. Um, it, and opposite to Molly, I actually grew up on the, on the west side. And so, uh, you know, I remember taking, whether it's through field trips or with family or anything else, you know, taking spring field trips, you know, over to Grant County, to Kittitas County. Apparently, I experienced enough of it that, you know, when I got done with my uh, college on the west side, I was like, you know what? I'd really like to know more about the habitats. I'd really like to know, you know, why are those various bird species there? Why are the, you know, what makes, you know, as, as Mike said in the film, you know, why, you know, why is everything at waist level and below? And so a lot of it, it's just, and I, hopefully we got that point out in the film. One of the best ways is just kind of embrace that curiosity, get out in it. You don't have to know everything. No, all of us don't know everything, not even close, but just get out there. And I know some people put it in the chat of, you know, what are some good resources? I think several of us were helping with that, but just kind of get out there. You know, what's that wallflower? What's that bird I'm hearing? What's that, what's that scat of, you know, what, what, what little mouse made that? And so just kind of embrace your little inner child and get out there and explore. And quite frankly, that's, that's the start. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, for those of us with, you know, kind of a Western mindset and we're trained in science and my background was soil science and wildlife biology science. And we try to, we tend to look at things that way. We look at it as facts and figures and numbers. And I think it's, it's something we, we, we need to learn from our Native American friends that you, you also need to think about the stories. And we learn so much from the stories and the visuals and the experience of, of others. I think it's a generational thing that we have to mix together so that we can bring together the science and the generational knowledge um, to really truly understand this, this, this landscape. Um, I've, I'm a hunter and I've chased mules across shrub step for going on 35 years. And that's where I've learned most of my lessons about shrub step. It wasn't from the books and the, and the reading and whatnot, but it was just getting out there and, and, and living it and understanding it and listening, I guess, to, to what I was hearing and, and, and what I was seeing as well. So um, I think that's just an important thing to remember to, to get that, that use of that, you know, totally age-old generational knowledge. We have to open our minds and have to think about how that can be applied to what we're seeing out there today. Yeah, I mean, all of you have talked about how important Shrubs of Habitat is, how beautiful it is and how much you admire it. So. Uh, what makes Washington shrub step habitat so unique? Um, can I, I'll go ahead and take a stab at this one. Um, uh, and it kind of relates to a question somebody had too about British Columbia and the, the Okanagan up there. Um, we 
what make so Washington shrub step basically encompasses a good chunk of the uh, Columbia Plateau or basin, what some people think of as that basin. It's that whole area uh, that's right along the Columbia River, and it's a fairly dry area make, in central Washington, southeastern Washington, extends a bit into to Oregon and also up into British Columbia along the Okanagan Valley. Well, what makes the Washington uh, shrub step different from the similar types of habitats you might find in Nevada or Southern Oregon, Idaho, Ca Colorado, even Northeastern California and Wyoming, um, is that our shrub step up here tends to be far more dominated by grass. So if you go down to these same sorts of outwardly similar sorts of habitats in Wyoming, for example, or Idaho or Nevada, what you're gonna find is that there's a lot of sagebrush, but then there's also grass and, and wildflowers underneath them, but nowhere near the density and diversity of wildflowers and grasses that we have up here. We just have a moister, ironically, it seems pretty dry to us, but, but it's, a, it's a habitat that seems to support a lot more vegetation and maybe it's because of our volcanoes maybe it's because of the weather it's kind of hard to say but but it means that our shrub step is somewhat different and it's also somewhat isolated so things like pygmy rabbits which are found in the columbia basin um, they're also found in south southern oregon but the populations are not and apparently based on genetics have never been connected and or at least not in thousands and thousands of years. And it's the same way with sage grouse. So you look at those two species, which seem so different, and yet for many thousands of years, they've lived in the Columbia Basin and their populations are not interchanging with populations in Idaho and Oregon, which are the two closest uh, populations that you would find of those species. So that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on up here. It's a, it's a unique area, it's isolated, it has different characteristics, and that adds to the special nature of it. Very well said. Jay? Yeah, um, going back to my soil science roots, um, it's interesting in the world, there are 12 orders of soils. In the whole world, there's 12 major types of soils. And in Kittitas County alone, so in Eastern Washington shrub step community, there are 10 of the, of the world soil orders found in just in Kittitas County, let alone all of Eastern Washington. So you have this tremendous <clears throat> diversity of soils, which amounts to a tremendous diversity in precipitation and soil forming factors. Like Michael said, there was volcanoes and there was glaciers and, there, and that creates this huge variety of vegetation and plants. And when you have that, you have a huge variety of animals and species. And so Washington is truly an amazing special place. When you look at the shrub step, it's all condensed down into an amazing, wonderful place that has this variety that you can't find anywhere else. And it changes very rapidly from, you know, Vantage to the Cascade Crest on Snoqualmie Pass is only about 80 miles. And there's 10 of the world's 12 soil orders in that area. That means complete amount of diversity that you see in the plants and animals, which makes it so special. Scott? Yeah, another thing that's um, unique about today's Washington shrub step, not necessarily historically, um, you know, if you drive through southern Idaho, eastern Oregon, Wyoming, you would be in this habitat for hours. You know, often, unless you're driving through, Washington still does have a few large chunks, um, but a lot of times, some of the connectivity areas might only be a half mile or a mile wide. And so uh, that's, you know, and unfortunately that's just what we face down the Columbia Basin of, uh, you know, it's just, you know, maintaining those, those connectivity areas is really vital as some of these species being able to move from one block to another. And, uh, and that's another one that kind of makes us unique here that, you know, we have to really preserve those or work to enhance them that some other states aren't necessarily faced with yet and hopefully they won't be, so yeah. I saw a few different questions in the chat along those same lines. Would anyone else like to expound on how Washington shrub step is doing or what else presents a threat for our sage lands heritage here in this state? Uh, 
Go ahead, Molly. Well, as we unfortunately experienced in September 2020, um, wildfire is a huge concern in the shrub step. Um, our entire ranch burned in 2017. Um, and um, as tragic as that really felt and seemed and was, um, we're finding that it is actually bouncing back beautifully, maybe even in a little bit better condition in some instances. And so where that takes my mind is, you know, if we could, and going back to, you know, um, our indigenous, um, you know, what, what was happening, you know, if we could get a um, fire back into the landscape in an appropriate way, um, it seems like it could really benefit from it. Um, over, you know, these just mega fires that are burning just so hot and so fast. And um, the, the sagebrush and the bitter brush are particularly hard hit in these really intense fires. And so, um, but having said that, um, they're also coming back. They just don't grow very fast. So you have to be very patient, um, but, but, they, but they do come back. This is a, this is a I think, from my perspective, this is a much more resilient landscape than I sort of thought it was um, in my, you know, younger wildlife biologist days. I thought that once it was disturbed, that was sort of the end of it. And, it, and that sometimes is the case, um, but it's also very resilient, which is encouraging to me. Um, so I think the, you know, that I would say now the bigger um, threat to it since it can recover from fire is actually having it being broken up into pieces and um, that's development is a, a much larger threat to it even I would say even now than more than fire. Jay? Yeah a couple things come to my mind um, one is that you know when we look at habitat we see that we see it as habitat and grass for, for wildlife when ranchers look at shrub step, they see it as forage for animals, for their, for their livestock. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that those two things can be worked out together, but it takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of proper planning. It takes good grazing management rotations. And so while it's a threat, it's also going to be, I think, a, a good answer to some of the things we're seeing in fire dangers, for instance. You know, proper grazing can help reduce some of that fire in my mind. There's a lot of science that supports that. Um, I think it's important that we realize that this is multiple use lands, you know, people are trying to make a living off it, as well as trying to enjoy it and see the wildlife species that are out there and just the pure beauty of it. So if there's new technology on the way, I think that's really fa fantastic, you know, some things to consider. Um, usually proper grazing management requires moving animals through a landscape, you know, and that requires fences. Well, fences can be harmful to wildlife, so some neat things on the horizon where they're gonna possibly be doing more things with virtual fencing, you know, similar to shocking a cow if it, if it reaches a point where it doesn't, you don't want it. So um, there's some neat things happening there. The other thing I think that can be a threat to this area, other than what Molly mentioned, fire and development, can be some of the push now to get to a, a renewable energy source. And I, I think we all agree that we need more solar, we need more wind, but it's gotta be placed in the right places. And sometimes, shrub step looks like the right place to people that don't understand it. And in reality, there might be areas in shrub step or in cropland, but also in cities where we can make those developments happen instead of taking them out the most extremely valuable shrub step component of our ecosystem. So that's some things I'm thinking about. Really quickly on that point of solar, since I know it came up in the chat as well, that the state legislature has approved a process to refine how the state selects and chooses or approves sites for solar farm developments, including Eastern Washington. We're expecting that there'll be some more news on that early in the next year as that process moves forward. So definitely stay tuned to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Conservation Northwest, groups like Audubon Society and the Nature Conservancy, all of whom are involved in making sure that if we are gonna have solar developments in central Washington shrub step, there's a good process in place for how we vet where and, and how those are built. You're on, you're on mute, Ted. 
Thanks, Mike. So I have a question for my fellow uh, panelists, just in terms of that development. You know, Jay was talking about um, you know how different people see the land. Well, you know, developers see the land as is a big, wide open slate and something that they can build houses on or warehouses or, or whatever. How can that be checked without you know? We're, we're trying to connect together these different fragments of, of shrub step, but in, what, what can be done about that short of, you know, saying no development? Is there a way that, that uh, this development can coexist with, um, you know, the people on the land or is it just gonna be an onslaught of people coming forever? And um, I'm just, just curious. Yeah, I think, I think we have to be proactive about where these developments can occur sort of ahead of the ahead of the development pressure because uh you know it's really hard to stop something once it's got a full head of steam but it's uh but the other thing that i think plays a role in this is we have to be able to have more people understand the value of shrub steps so that when these things do pop up there are more there's a bigger constituency arguing in favor of protecting those sites and we're already seeing some of that now, which is actually kind of amazing to see that more people coming to, to the defense of some of these, uh, these really important areas. And I think that's really a good sign. I thought I'd also kind of throw something out here that Molly um, brought up earlier in a comment and also mentioned it later. And that had to do with that picture behind her. And, and you could look at the same picture behind me and say the same thing is that you can go back 100 years or 120 years, there are more people that were living out there then than are now. Um, but what happens uh, is that people couldn't make a living out there on 160 acres of land or whatever it was they had because it's a very dry landscape. And unless you have the resources to, to, to grow a crop or raise the livestock you need to survive, you're not gonna be able to make a living on that small amount of land. So the reason why I'm bringing this up again is because making a living on the land is changing in the pandemic as well. And the development pressure, there's development pressure going on that has very little to do with like solar power and other things is people want to live on the, they, people want to live out there. And there are people who are wanting to live out on these wide open spaces now. And with the pandemic, there's a new discovery that you can work from really remote areas. And now the pressure to live in these remote areas is actually going up. And so we're starting to see things going back in the other direction where these areas that, that have been declining in population are now starting to increase again. And that's ultimately gonna be where our shrub step areas really face uh, a, a very serious threat because you can recover from fire, but how do you recover, you know, from a whole bunch of houses and uh, and all the pets and livestock that people have and ranchettes and things like that? It gets really tough. Yeah, we're talking about many threats to shrub step habitat, including wildfires invasive species, development. Um, there are also a few questions about climate change and what that, what, how that will impact shrub sub habitat. Does anybody wanna um, talk about climate change a little bit? Scott, I don't know if your hand was up for this question, but do you wanna take a stab at it? Um, yeah, but I also wanna go back to the other one. So uh, one, as my position, I'm a habitat biologist with, uh, Fish and wildlife, and that ranges everywhere from trying to do habitat restoration to dealing with, uh, you know, as population is not going the other way. Uh, so we have the growth manage back in Washington State, and and kind of you know how do we do kind of responsible development, and whether it's forest, whether it's shrub step, I think the common theme of all that is we have to step back and and basically landscape plans. What do we see not next week i mean it's literally kind of like playing whack-a-mole of you know when you make your sound like you're 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 against everyone and that's not very successful that, that angers a lot of people but step back of going okay if this is suddenly 2060 what do we want the columbia basin to look like 
what do we want Okanagan County? What do we want Kittitas County to look like? And so I think we have a lot more success there, whether it's habitat restoration, whether it's people living on the land, responsible solar development. And so the more that people, if you really have a passion for this, and you know, a lot of the times those work groups that kind of do those kind of plans, get involved if you have ideas, because they're they're really every every person brings a diverse set of eyes to something. And so the more diversity we have in there, probably the closer we're gonna get to actually being successful as far as kind of, you know, what what do we want our kids, grandkids, great grandkids to have back to inherit? Um, real quickly, as far as climate change, I, I would say that um, one of the factors I know that we're starting to look at regarding shrub step is, you know, and unfortunately quite a few of the areas, you know, climate probably isn't going to be a great friend as far as fire cycles. And so, um, you know, like Molly was, Molly was indicating that, you know, land's very resilient to fire. One of the biggest struggles has just simply been the intensity and the frequency. Because you're right, historically, fire was a part of this landscape. And so I think that's one of the things we do have to tackle is things like invasive species or, or just these mega fires. And it sets stuff back so dramatically, the landscape, it's really hard to recover from that. And it's not gonna get any better with climate change. So the more we can kind of build resiliency in, maybe that means some low scale fires here and kind of accept that this is the reality. I think we're probably gonna be better off that way, so. Yeah, I really like how you touched on, I mean, what we do now is gonna affect future generations. So. Uh, we need to put in the effort now and, and make sure that we're preserving this habitat. Molly? Yeah, so I'm going to kind of answer both questions as well. Um, so, um, except that I lost my train of thought. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to start with the climate change and hope that my <laughs> original, original thing comes back to me. So the way I see it is that, um, you know, for me personally, carbon sequestration is my um, part of, of, of the climate change battle. And, and, and how I see that is, is keeping a large tract of land intact so that we have thriving, growing plants, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. And so I, I feel that, again, that, that that's a direct relationship to, to the climate change issue is keeping, you know, we know if this turns into a strip mall, it's not gonna be sequestering any carbon. You know, we, I don't think we have a really good understanding of how much carbon is sequestered from a, the shrub step habitat. It's probably, um, there's probably studies that I have not read yet. Um, so, so it's keeping it intact in my mind is what's important for climate change. And what is threatening that is, I'll just tell you on a personal level, we get offers, I would say at least once a month um, from um, energy development companies um, for offering to buy parts of the ranch. And it's real money. It's a, it's a lot of money that they're offering. And so how, if a rancher is struggling just to pay their property taxes, um, how are they not going to um, be drawn <laughs> by those very high dollar amounts? And so I think that conservation easements are very, very important. Um, that would be my recommendation for any, you know, um, for anybody is if we could get more tracks of shrub step in conservation easements um, so that, that, that the folks who are on the land can stay on the land, continue to um, pay property taxes in order to keep a land intact. And Washington, you know, is the smallest land um, base with the highest population in the Rocky Mountain West. And so there's no way we're going to do this without a strong relationship between private and public lands. There just isn't, there, there's not enough whole pieces of public land um, to keep you know, um, a migration corridors open. And so 
I, I see it as that we're going to have to really work together. There's going to have to be a lot of partnerships in order to keep it intact. Are there a few examples of these partnerships in Washington State? That's been a, a couple of the questions in the Q and A. Um, I mean, just asking if there's examples of partnerships around maybe fire management, salmon rehabilitation, and other areas of conservation. Uh, go ahead, Jay. Um, I wasn't going to answer that question, but uh, a little bit in my mind on climate change is that um, when I first started with NRCS many years ago, the answer to stream problems, for instance, was build big structures, build Gabion rock structures, engineer something big and huge. And what's interesting now in the work we get to do with a lot of different partners um, to create a better riparian area, more wetland acres, more wet meadows, which are things we're going to need as, as climate change advances. We're going to need those wetter areas as, as you know, climate refugia, as fire refugia. When fires come through, a lot of times that's where species go just to survive the fire and where seed sources come from for after the fires. Um, and one of the, the, some of the newest technology now that you hear about, and I, I hope it's coming from you know, historical information as well as the science areas, is let beavers do their work. You know, provide methods where beavers can be put back on the landscape um, and we help them along if we can just to get them back on that landscape by doing things that resemble beaver dams, building beaver dam analogs, which are similar to what a beaver would do, but probably not as well built as they can do it. Um, creating structures called Z-dike structures that you know, can help head cutting from occurring. So we're trying to, I think in a way, in shrub step, you eventually start to focus on those wetter areas and keeping them wet and doing it with the, the best technology as well as the best historical and, and knowledge from our Native American friends. That's how we're gonna, I think, prepare for the, some of the things that are coming at us with a drier climate. And we can't just do it with modern science. We have to look at it in a way that takes into account the history of the area. I was just a couple of seconds, just gonna echo what you were saying, Molly, as far as um, some of those same grant programs that you know us as public agencies use to actually purchase land when people wanna sell, they also are conservation easements. And that is an amazing tool. If, if someone wants to sell the land, they have heritage there, it's a multi-generation ranch. They just need some help. Like they're doing good stuff for habitat and they just, you're right, they don't wanna, you know, I, back in a former life, I also did some stuff with wind power and renewable energy. And those are, it's really hard to turn down those huge checks that are coming in. And so if it's, if that's another tool that some of us in the public agencies can use is working with landowners to just kind of let it be working lands and, and do it in a habitat way. And one of the tools there is a conservation easement. So I hope, you know, Hopefully we could continue doing that and continue working with some of the, the private landowners because that that is one of the ways that we kind of help sustain this landscape. So if there was one overall goal for shrub sub habitat in Washington State, what would the, the highest priority take for conservation for conserving shrub sub habitat? Go ahead, Jay. Uh, just a quick example would be um, because of colonization, because of the way things develop, you ended up with islands of habitat. And that's going to be very dangerous going into the future if we don't keep those islands connected for species, for, for the use of the land, for, for the plants and the animals. So I'd say one of the areas that our, my organization, Conservation Northwest, likes to focus on is those connectivity zones, those important areas between what's left of the shrub step habitat. And as you drive around Eastern Washington in particular, if you're in a large area of shrub step, you think, what's the problem? It looks great, there's habitat everywhere. It doesn't take much though to study your maps and realize you're just in an island. And what connects it to the next island so that these species have genetic diversity and can survive and we don't start seeing some of them blink out. So I'd say some of those connectivity zones are some of the most important areas where we can tend to focus. I think there was a couple. Yes, so, oh, go ahead, George. Go ahead. No, go ahead. 
<laughs> Sorry to jump in. There was a couple questions in the chat about sage grouse, which are in a bit of a unique position here in Washington state. I think one of the person, um, Kate in the question and answer was asking about the federal sage grouse plans that were announced under the Obama administration that have become a little bit of a political football since then. But as some of you may know, Washington was excluded from that plan and our sage grouse are, are isolated and in a bit of a different situation. Michael, do you think you could give a kind of sage grouse 101 and talk about these unique birds a little bit? Um, sure, be, ha be happy to. And uh, it actually relates to some of what uh, Jay was just talking about as well. Um, so if you look at, if you look at sage grouse across the country, um, there are much bigger populations than we have in Washington. The, 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 the estimate for this spring was somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 sage grouse in the state. And most of those are in Douglas County, which is a pretty fragmented landscape, you know, one that consists of a lot of cropland, uh, the Conservation Reserve Program, which we haven't really talked about much, uh, and native shrub step. And, uh, and sage grouse have learned to, to live in that fairly well, but uh, of course, they have challenges like wildfires and all the other sorts of things that go along with that. But uh, what's been interesting is if you look at uh, if you look at the genetics of sage grouse, and one of the things you can learn from genetics is you can get an indication of what's happened historically with the species. And what the genetics tell us is that sage grouse in Washington are isolated from sage grouse in other states and have been for many thousands of years. And that's something we already talked about. But uh, we've also learned using genetics that even if we have three populations of sage grouse in the state, and the other two populations are smaller, one on the Yakima Training Center, and then a really small population in Lincoln County. What we've learned uh, looking at genetics is just to give an example, the sage grouse in Douglas County and the sage grouse at the Yakima Training Center are only separated by about 30 miles. That separation is enough that you can genetically tell a sage grouse. Uh, if you look at a feather of a sage grouse, you can look at the genetics on it. You can tell whether that bird is from the Acma Training Center or from Douglas County. Those birds used to be connected. They've been separated already long enough that genetically you're starting to see something that the geneticists call genetic drift that genetic drift has already separated those two populations so much that you can tell them apart. And what happens over time with genetic drift is that you lose genetic, that genetic uh, variation that's normal in a population that allows a species to adapt to change. That change can include things like climate change, that it can include things like differences in uh, species that might uh, be on their landscape. There's all sorts of things that the, that the genetics can relate to. So losing that genetic variation is extremely important in, in, in how species can become damaged in the long term. And that's already happening. And the reason why it's happening is the populations are small, they're isolated, the lack of connections really starts to matter. Things like pygmy rabbits, which can't fly, it matters even faster. Sage grouse aren't migratory like a lot of species like um, brewer sparrows, sage, sage thrashers, sagebrush sparrows, which are also species that live in that landscape. Um, this type of genetic uh, isolation maybe doesn't affect them as much, but it's clearly affecting sage grouse and, uh, and we're already seeing the impacts of that. Oh yeah, I know you asked me about something else too. Oh, the, the listing part of it. That So some of you may not know, uh, like the FET, for example, in the budget negotiations that go on in Congress on a regular basis, they're actually, they've actually in the last few years put riders on budgets that, that actually prohibit the listing of sage grouse uh, as an endangered species. So they actually put uh, a rider that, I mean, this is the federal budget and sage grouse have their own special rider where they'll say, you can't spend any money on any effort to list sage grouse. Well, one of the things that uh, uh, they, they've done in the latest budget as, uh, as I recall, just uh, there's a, an organization that puts out regular uh, messages on what's going on. And they've said that that 
that typical rider that's been on the budget has been eliminated uh, in this go around. So after several years, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service would be able to actually spend money on, on uh, listing sage grouse if that's what they wanted to do. Um, just because they want to list something doesn't mean it's going to happen though, because there's a lot of things that go into it, uh, whether you have a significant population. Sage grouse, there's a lot of sage grouse in states like Wyoming. And uh, that impacts whether they would want to list sage grouse. So there's a lot that goes into decisions like that that are above and beyond the borders of Washington state. Thanks so much, Michael. And I would just note too that while sage grouse are not federally listed in Washington, they are listed as endangered by the state and are also identified as a species of greatest conservation need in Washington under state wildlife action plan that the Department of Fish and Wildlife is required to produce. And in fact, there's a bill working its way through Congress right now, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, that would specifically fund state and local conservation programs for species that are listed as having the greatest conservation need, like sage grouse, also bighorn sheep in Washington. And uh, we're really hopeful that that bill may pass, if not this year, early next year, and really provide a big boost for species like sage grouse in Washington's shrub step. Um, and then I also, I think Scott had a, some um, thoughts that he wanted to share. There were some good questions about state and tribal co-management. And Scott, maybe, do you wanna jump in on that now? Yeah, I was just gonna to touch on some stuff uh, that, you, you know, Emily, you highlighted in the video and you've highlighted here, but I wanted to, um, so on the fisheries end, you know, we're, we're intricately uh, linked. I mean, just about every, honestly, a lot of the habitat restoration projects in rivers are actually done by tribes on public lands. So awesome coordination. Um, I, I think we're starting to get there on some of the land, but I think we still honestly have a lot of, a lot of work to do. Yeah, I know we've collaborated a couple of times on, on some species stuff, but I can remember a lot of work groups that, yeah, a lot of us have expertise but we're not doing like what you mentioned, Emily, of sitting down of, you know, I, we don't necessarily have any elders sitting in that group going, you know, what did that landscape look like 100, 150, 200 years ago? And so I, I do think there's some stuff that we could probably, to be frank and honest, probably do a little bit better to actually get a little bit more coordinated and actually to truly recognize the history of that land when we factor in restoration. And so I, I, I hope we get there because uh, I think that would be really good to truly, like you said, Emily, truly learn the history, not just the history of what did my predecessor do 10 years ago, but truly learn the history out there and actually build that into shrub step restoration. Go ahead, Mike. It looks like you, you want yeah. to say something. Yeah, I wanted to throw something else out there too. I, I know I've been tend to focus on grouse for obvious reasons, but but I wanted to, to mention uh, the tribes and pronghorn. Uh, pronghorn are also a shrub step species. And if you if you go back and look at the archaeological record in, in the state of Washington, you will find evidence of pronghorn in a lot of native sites around the around the, the shrub step regions of Washington. And uh, I wanted to mention this because the Yakima Nation as well as the Colville Confederated Tribes have both uh, been introducing uh, pronghorn back onto the landscape. And there are pronghorns still that are out there as part of those uh, relocation projects. I believe they got them from Nevada. But what I think it's important to recognize is that this is a pretty significant effort to reestablish uh, a species that's native to the shrub step of Washington. And actually, I think it's a pretty positive step that the tribes are taking efforts like that. And, uh, and so that's worth noting. Really quick, one other example of tribal and nonprofit collaboration that relates to pronghorn is just recently Conservation Northwest 
closed on a campaign to acquire nearly 10,000 acres up in Okanagan County where the shrub step starts to make its way uphill towards the Kettle River Range. And in fact, that was a property where one of the, I think at least one, maybe several of the pronghorn that were reintroduced by the Colville tribes had actually wandered through. And it's one of those places that has real important habitat values for species like sharp-tailed grouse and mule deer, connectivity values for some of our larger carnivores. And it was a successful campaign because of partnership and collaboration between the Colville tribes with Conservation Northwest and many of our donors. And to see that land given back to the tribes as its stewards forever, I think was a really special thing. And our hope is that it's a blueprint for other campaigns to follow in the future for those pronghorn and for the future generations that are gonna get to enjoy that land. Go ahead, Jay. You're on mute. <laughs> Michael brought up pronghorn, which is a very, very cool species, and uh, that the tribes have brought them back, which is just awesome for our state. Um, the interesting thing about pronghorn is they're built to run, and they're, they're built to cover a lot of territory, and they have definite migratory paths. And uh, like down on the Yakima Reservation where they were brought back, they're now way outside of the reservation and moving into some of the non-reservation land, private land. So it kind of forces people to think about how can we work together on things? And that's what's really cool is there's gonna be some great partnerships formed around antelope. And also on the Colville Reservation, a lot of those animals you know, immediately swam the, uh, the Columbia River and came down into Douglas County into private farm grounds. So everybody's, you know, getting a little bit excited about see them back on the landscape. And it's gonna be cool because it's gonna bring together, I think, people that have to think together, take into account Native American culture and history around these animals, as well as some of the science work together because it's a variety of lands that, that these animals exist on. So that's gonna be really neat stuff. Fencing is gonna have a big part of it, maybe dropping some of the fences and replacing them with other alternatives could be a, a really good answer to help those animals get back into our state. Yeah, the wildlife here really requires a lot more room than what they're given. And so collaborating with different landowners and different organizations is really the key to, to helping preserve these species. Go ahead, Molly. I was just gonna chime in because occasionally we get some of the antelope down here that the Colville's released and it's very, very exciting. And I, I'm always trying to figure out how I can entice them to set up shop permanently here, but they haven't so far. <laughs> um, let's see. So, I mean, we already talked a little bit about fire, um, but let's talk about management a little bit. So one of the questions was how are prescribed burns managed differently on the east side compared to more forested environments? Molly? So basically um, in this arid landscape, um, prescribed fire um, has become a challenge because of those invasive species that are growing, particularly cheatgrass. Um, they, we, our fire season is sort of, you know, um, March through early December <laughs> now, which is um, unfortunate and uh, complicates things. So the cheatgrass creates sort of a ladder fuel up into um, the shrub step, the shrub canopy. And so even, you know, even in times where we would want to put a prescribed burn through a system, um, they can be a challenge to handle. And also wind is an issue in these landscapes too. Like sometimes, um, they'll, a wind will come up that sort of nobody was expecting and, and really have a fire takeoff. So I think right now we're trying to figure out how to do that well, how to reintroduce fire safely, effectively back onto this landscape, because right now it's, um, it, it makes people nervous <laughs> and for kind of good reason. Um, but I'm, my suggestion um, is after these big burns, 
reintroduce fire after the um, before the shrub component comes back onto the landscape and so that you get the, the low intensity burns through that and just sort of after a big you know catastrophic fire use fire going forward so that it becomes the norm on the landscape um, but we, we're just not quite there yet with prescribed burn from my perspective yeah i'm talking about other efforts in Washington State to help protect, connect, and restore shrub step habitat, especially after fires. Jay, do you want to talk a little bit about the shrub step proviso? Um, yeah, the after the 2020 fires, Pearl Hill, Cold Springs, and, and then moving into 21, the legislature passed. Um, basically, they said, "How bad is it?" And I think the answer was, "It's really bad." And, and then, what can we do? And so the answer was several things. And so they passed a budget of two and a half million dollars per biennium um, that can go on, I think, if they can appropriate funds every biennium um, to do things like restore burned areas, prevent fires from happening in the first place, um, have a faster reaction to keep fires from getting too big, um, uh, coming up with wildlife friendly fencing, uh, cost share, um, what else? Uh, do, uh, focus on species recovery, and actually pay uh, ranchers to, de to defer grazing instead of getting back out on the land too soon, which sometimes they're pressured to do because they've used up all their hay after a fire, um, to actually have them be paid for hay so that they can defer that land and let it recuperate more naturally um, and not bring invasive species into the mix. So it's a, it's a little bright spot on the screen. In fact, it's a big bright spot that there's that amount of money that can be spent on all ownerships, private, federal, tribal, state, um, we're still figuring out how that's going to all play out and how that money is going to get out there and start getting things done, but it's a, definitely a bright spot on the horizon. And Emily, there are a lot of questions about controlled burns. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, historically how these controlled burns can be used in shrubs of habitat? Um, well, we had a control burn uh, October 8th. So, I mean, it's not something that's gone away. I would hate to even couch it under something that we used to do. <laughs> I mean, it's something that we've continued to do. And a lot of people have misunderstood that aspect. I mean, one of some of my favorite uh, records to read are when they say, we went through this area and the natives just burned up everything. And it's like they completely misunderstood our resource management. And for a lot of effects, people are still coming to understand what resource management means when it comes to fire. Fire is necessary for resource management in this area. We as natives have understood that. There are difficulties now, obviously, um, because you know resources have changed. When we talk about um, the resources that are involved, in this area, we can't just look at one single resource, right? That's the beauty of like the film and all of the different resources that are shown. We have to look at, you know, what are the wildlife response? What is the um, plant response? So when you have, uh, let's just give one example of sockeye, you have historically at least 200,000 sockeye that are migrating through the Yakima River for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. And then that stops. What is the wildlife response to that? What happens then when we have a fire? What happens when the bears that used to eat the fish then go and poop in the woods and they poop out all those nutrients that a lot of us pay a lot of money for? I'm mean, anybody that has fish oil supplements, that's a nod to you, but or a lot of fish. Um, you know, that, those marine derived nutrients enrich that soil, they enrich the trees, they make them stronger. So then when you try to put in a plan where it's like, you know what? let's scroll forward 100 years. Now let's do traditional burns like the natives said. Well, no, you have to look at different aspects. Like let's look at what's impacting the salmon. Let's look at the culverts. Let's address those types of things. Let's look at the habitat with that. And then let's try to make sure that the resources that we have and that have been a part of this land continue to be a part of that land. And the people that have continued to have a relationship with them, that we learn to respect them. We don't take them through fish wars. We don't take them and say that, I don't know what they're doing or why they do it, but I'm gonna be over here, hunker down with my laptop with no peripheral vision on this plan because I'm given a set deadline and a timeline to complete this project and I will get degraded and not have enough uh, to you know, move things forward. 
So, I mean, there's a lot of bureaucratic stuff that comes in it. And luckily I'm outside of all those systems. I'm outside of the tribe. I'm outside of the state. So I can say it like this. Um, <laughs> but, you know, again, I do want to um, give a nod to our people in our fuels management at the tribe. They do continue traditional burn methods. Um, they do use upgraded technology as a part of that. There's different videos and photos that are out there. I don't know that there's, um, any that are uh, publicly available, maybe Troy Watt Limit, you can try to search that on Facebook and find uh, his TikTok. Thanks, Emily. Um, how about, I mean, how do you all teach your children about shrub step ecosystems? I mean, we talked a little bit about growing up and how we kind of just happened across it. So how do you uh, pass this along to future generations? Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I can speak both ways. Actually, I have having two, two daughters, so personal hand, but also uh, kids in general. So, um, you know, again, just uh, emboldening the, the curiosity. I mean, we're talking about shrub step tonight, but it's true of any habitat. You know, like, I, I think we all went and played in creeks as kids. Like, well, went out and you know, is there a snake underneath that rock? And so just getting out, yeah, once they get kind of a taste of it, you know, there's resources, there's resources teachers can get, but it's just getting them out. You know, like Mike, you're indicating, you know, your, your, your daughter didn't wind up being a biologist, but she remembers the grouse from that morning. And so just getting them out, what's that bird? And quite frankly, a lot of, you know, uh, one of my daughters kind of wants to go be a bird biologist. One of them is fine looking at butterflies and both are, I couldn't be happier. It's like, let them discover what they think is cool. But I think that's the best thing we can do out there is get them out. And then when they have questions, let's be ready to teach them and have the answers. Okay. Um. I think uh, one of my best memories of working in wolf recovery, which had a lot of conflict involved with it because there was people that wanted wolves and people that didn't want wolves and the Conservation Northwest, we were trying to kind of find the middle ground and say, hey, let's try to work together and put herd supervisors out there. And we had a lot of programs going on, but it was a lot of stressful time for me. And um, I asked my daughter one day, they had the day where they're supposed to spend a day with their parents. I said, do you want to go with mom to the office? You want to go with me out and maybe we'll see some wolves? And she said, okay, I'll go with you. <laughs> and uh, we crawled up on a ridge with another friend and we knew where the den was in the, in the twist, the lookout pack. And we spent the whole day there in the sun and it was mostly shrub step habitat going up into the timber. So we got to talk about a lot of things about shrub step and just watch the day evolve. Didn't see a thing. And we just kept watching the den because that's where we thought they would show up on the ridge on the side hill away from us. And then all of a sudden she tapped my shoulder and said, Dad, I see a wolf. I go, where? It's on our ridge. It's coming up towards us. <laughs> I go, no, that can't be. And as we looked, yeah, it was a wolf, a beautiful, beautiful female. And uh, she laid down and just went to sleep on a rock in the sun. And we sat there for at least another two hours watching that wolf just do nothing but get up and stretch and urinate and and lay back down and take another nap and they didn't know we were there but she never forgot it i never did either and i think that's the important thing is for kids is you know get them out show them what's out there that's what matters yeah and i think also just teaching everyone how to respect land emily i really loved how you mentioned um respecting people who are coming for these different resources and um, so how, how can we, I guess, respect the land, but also recreate on it? Like we can go out on hikes and biking and, and bring, you know, the toys that people want to want to drive around. How do we respectfully uh, admire this habitat? And that's a that's a question that applies to the biologists and conservationists as well. I mean, if there's any any thoughts as we talked about earlier, there's no doubt that recreation impact is growing in the shrub step. More and more people are discovering what I think many of us have known for a while that it's an incredible place, um, and that's only going to continue. 
any thoughts as folks on the ground about how we can balance all that enthusiasm in a sustainable way and respectful way? One thought in the chat said, from Troy says to treat anywhere you go as a culturally significant area. And I think that's really well said. Yeah, um, here I'll just add something here because uh, we in, in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, a lot of times we deal with this where we have sensitive species and people want to get out there and observe them. And one of the challenges we have is that a lot of, a lot of these species are on private lands. So what sometimes you can observe species from public roads, sometimes private lands is the only way you're gonna be able to get access to some of these areas. So I just want people to realize that a lot of these areas that are on, on private lands, they do need to respect that. Uh, I know that it, the same goes for tribal lands. They're just, you need, you need to know before you go uh, whether you have permission or not or get permission. Um, because it gets really frustrating for everybody involved if people are doing something that the landowner doesn't want. And I think well, there's a lot of landowners that are more than happy to, to let people go out and look for wildlife on their lands. But you need to, you need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, there's, there's some areas that you might not be welcome and there's some areas that they'll appreciate the fact that you ask before you, you go on. And uh, I think it's important because there's a, some of the best areas out there are private and, uh, and uh, some of the most incredible wildlife, the most incredible habitats and just, just need to appreciate that. Thank you for bringing that up, Michael. It's never been easier to find land ownership maps. You used to have to go down to the library and get a county plot map. And now you can get it right on your phone through apps like Gaia or Onyx. And in, particularly in the shrub step where it's very checkerboarded, it's, it's good to have those resources and know where the borderline is. And also if you can, you know, know who the landowner is and maybe they'd be willing to grant permission, but don't assume. Yeah. Yeah, to um, kind of echo what, what Mike was saying there. Same thing for um, for public lands. There are areas where it really is okay to go, you know, hike off wherever, explore, you know, ride your horse. Um, but there are other areas that it's been designated of, you know, vehicles can really tear up a lot, uh, you know, going off and just kind of creating your own path, you know, like Mike, you were saying, private lands. And so, I think we all want people to get out and explore the shrub step, but try to do it in a, for all the reasons mentioned here, culturally, protection of resources, wildlife sensitivity, you know, try to have some restraint when you are, when, when people have kind of designated those or have some awareness of maybe you're in a sensitive area. Um, and so I, I think there is a way to do that both, whether that's staying on a trail, staying on a road or, or kind of watching where you're stepping. Uh, if you notice in the film, one of the really cool things, I would actually encourage people to get out there, try to do it in a, in a responsible way. But if you can get out there in the spring, right after a fresh rain, there's what's known as cryptogamic crust. It's not all bare soil. There's a bunch of like little lichens and mosses everywhere. And so if you can get out there, you know, don't step everywhere and break it apart, but just get down on your hands and knees. And you can literally see what, you know, there's a whole little world that's literally underneath your feet. And so just explore things like that, but just try to also be sensitive of leaving your too much of an impact uh, when you're out there, so. Molly? Uh, recreation is a, a complex issue for sure. And, you know, the, uh, some of the challenges of it is, is that, you know, I think my recreation is the appropriate rec recreation and others not so much. And, and so balancing that, um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is currently um, working on a recreation management plan to try to juggle some of those really varying interests because some of them are pretty diametrically opposed. And, um, you know, we have to just be honest about that and that, that um, and, and how are we going to deal with that? Um, um, E-bikes are a big one that we hear at the commission right now a lot about. And, and so um, 
stay tuned. The department will have a recreation plan out. I'm not sure when it's due out, um, but to tackle some of these challenges. That's a great point, Molly. And along those same lines, Conservation Northwest has been working for about a year now on a new conservation program related to supporting sustainable outdoor recreation, but also providing some scientific analysis and review for recreational impacts that may be a challenge for wildlife and especially critical habitat for species like sage grouse or wolverines or Canada lynx. We've got some great information on our website about that new program, including the e-bike policy making process, which is, is already well underway, but I know that the Department of Fish and Wildlife, State Parks, and the Department of Natural Resources are expecting to put out a public comment period early next year um, about the regulations for electronic powered bicycles on state public lands. So a lot of good conversations happening on that topic in the shrub step and beyond, and stay tuned for opportunities to add your voice and perspectives. So what are all of your favorite places to go? and visit. I mean, I know there was a few questions about that in the chat, but if you just want to share that with the with the group. Well, I could I can start start this. Um, you showed in the video there are pictures of uh, dry falls. And one of the things I really like about that whole dry falls area is because it's sort of a you, you get an insight into geologic history for the whole region there. And one of the things that for me makes Douglas County special is the fact that the uh, during the ice age, the glacier, the, the Okanagan lobe of the Cordilleran ice sheet basically ended in the center, center part of Douglas County. And so you, you not only have this terminal moraine for that glacier, but you have all the unusual rocky landscapes that are behind it. And then you have the deeper soil areas that are in front of it that didn't get glaciated. And then you have, you know, the impact of that glacier blocking up the Columbia River and forcing it through Grand Coulee and, and southward into what's now Banks Lake. And, and just seeing that whole landscape and how glaciers not only impacted the past, but are still impacting our present. Uh, not only with the landscapes, but with land management and the way uh, landowners have had to, to make a living on such an, uh, an unusual rocky landscape, kind of is one of the reasons why the area is so wildlife rich now and why there are so many remnant patches of shrub step and why some of those areas are in such good condition, why there's still sage grouse, why there's still sharp-tailed grouse, why there's still pygmy rabbits. It kind of all goes together. And that's why like seeing dry falls kind of brings that out for me. It's like uh, it's like that symbol of all of that stuff that kind of goes into making the area special and that represents it as much as anything to me. Thank you for that, Michael. And before we continue with sort of the wrap up question of favorite places and then also any priorities that you all see for Shrub Step going forward, Emily, I think you had your hand up there for a little bit. We were talking about respectful recreation and some of the threats that are facing this, this landscape. And I, I don't think we called on you in time before we moved on. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I mean, so many people want resources. And I know that when I published my case study about the knowledge and the return of land that did include beavers. So I was so happy to hear beavers uh, discussed. Um, I got a lot of pushback from a lot of scientists in the field, including a professor that I was a keynote at with uh, in the EPA. Uh, he wasn't with the EPA, but it was a conference. And he said, I just don't see what value your research holds. And I was <laughs> really taken back. You know, we're co-keynoting on this really big Region 10 uh, thing, and I'm basically told that my writing, my research, my work, my write-up about this traditional knowledge is not worthy, according to this uh, professor at a university. And I really had to take a moment there, but I mean, I'm an athlete, so I'm quick with responses verbally sometimes when I need to be. And I just said, well, the National Science Foundation who funded my case study certainly seemed to think it had value. And obviously I'm a keynote on 
this panel alongside you. So I do definitely think there is some uh, value there as well as others. And uh, it is a peer reviewed <laughs> case study. And it took me a long time to really realize um, what was happening there and what had gone on. And, um, but that wasn't the only time there were, and he wasn't the only person. There was numerous people that would, um, when I used to work at the tribe and I worked in um, resource management field, um, the people, the person next to me was in wildlife, but we didn't have a door. You, I have no idea why we didn't have a door between our offices, that wall wasn't closed. So I would hang up from somebody and I would hear them on the other side of the wall call to check and ask, like, is what she published true? Is this really true? And then he would come back and be like, did you hear who called me? So I think there's this uncomfortable aspect of some people's learning style. They're uncomfortable with not being able to see something written by a white male, female, academic person. They're not used to this aspect in elevating oral history and knowledge. They're uncomfortable with the fact that their entire research doesn't include the oldest data set of the land held by Native people. And I think we have to be very frank in some of our presentations and conversations and saying, if you have never had an oral history inclusion in your, your uh, work, if you don't include the oldest data set of the land in your proposal, in your project, this is going to be hard for you. You are going to have to relearn things. And you as the aspect is organizational and partnerships, you're going to have to put the resources towards acquiring this information and also respecting that some of this information is proprietary. Some of the information about gathering, about specific foods, about their names, about where we gather, we don't share that um, as a tribal member. There's some things that we do, there's a lot that we don't. And you know, again, the film was very respectful of zooming out of all that, um, but I do, I continue to go back to this oldest data set, including our language. And I was so happy to see the um, title of the film was translated into our Yakima language. And I don't think we've said it here today. So I, I do want to just say it out loud. I, I realize that um, it's not said. So it's, uh, this land is a part of us in our itchy skin uh, language is itchy timani teacham iwa nimi. That's beautiful. And I think that's such an inspirational title to, I mean, represent this film too. And, and I really like how you said, I mean, it's not just about respecting the land or, or the species, it's also about respecting all of the voices who can add to our knowledge of this landscape. Uh, Molly, do you wanna add, I think you wanted to add about maybe your favorite recreational place. Well, I don't, I can't, I can't top what Emily just said. <laughs> I don't want to go after Emily anymore. Um, and Emily, I, I'm really sorry that that happened to you at that conference. Um, that is atrocious. Um, and thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for making us uncomfortable. I think it's really important. Um, so to get back to, <laughs> um, gosh, it's, it's just hard to top that. Um, and I'm not trying to top it. Uh, it's just hard to go after that. Um, so I was just going to say that uh, uh, with the governor's stay at home order, uh, I love that because I got to stay on my favorite piece of shrub step. Uh, <laughs> and I was very happy to stay home and not go anywhere because I love this place so much. Um, if for folks who are um, wanting um, sort of to experience an area that's similar to what's in my background, um, I would recommend Douglas Crick, which is the, the BLM unit. So it's open to the public. Um, the road is a little challenging. So a four wheel drive is to get to the area is kind of um, a good idea for sure. But that would be my recommendation for folks who wanna see that. Yeah, I, I would also second Mike's uh, option of going to Dry Falls State Park. I think that is literally just an amazing, beautiful scene. Um, and, and really the, the history of the flood and everything there is just uh, spectacular. And, and being living in Ellensburg and being from Spokane, I was always like, 
oh, I've lived in shrubs at my whole life. I know what it looks like. But then I, I started working for Conservation Northwest. I started work like expanding and, and visiting all these other places. And Douglas County Shrub Step is absolutely gorgeous. I love going there any chance that I get. So I, I highly recommend that to anybody. Um, I guess, how about we end on, I mean, what can, what can people do to help protect shrubs of habitat? What volunteer opportunities are out there for people to participate in? And uh, like, what suggestions do you have to find those opportunities? Scott? Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll hit on something uh, it was, it was Molly that you said in the, in the film and I think uh, some of it's tied into the proviso work, but we we are starting to kind of capture some of those opportunities. Uh, I think throughout this fall between DFW, uh, Conservation Northwest, there's been quite a few of, you know, sagebrush planting parties. Uh, there's always volunteer events of, you know, Jay, you touched on kind of how some of the events, you know, can be, um, oh, I'll just say harmful to wildlife. Uh, and so kind of getting rid of some of those old, um, you know, some of our wildlife area managers have, have, have done those of, you know, kind of getting out and rolling up old fence, getting it off the landscape. Uh, and so um, whether it's my agency, Conservation Northwest, a lot of the conservation districts around, just kind of watch for a lot of those. There are an amazing amount of volunteer opportunities. And that is honestly some of the best stuff that you can do, just get, if you want to be out there in this amazing habitat, just kind of get your boots on the ground and, and just kind of help put some hours in. And that really does help a lot. It's, it's yeah, I'll end with that. Okay. You're on mute, Jay. <laughs> There's a ton of opportunities I think that keep popping up, especially after fires. You know, there's always people are eager to respond after a fire. And I guess I make a little push for responding before the fire. And some of the things that Emily was saying are, are so true as well that not all fire is bad, but an uncontrolled fire in the wrong place at the wrong time can do a lot of damage, especially if it's burning too hot and, and it's not where you wanted it to go or had didn't, wasn't it? doing the purpose you set out to why you had that fire, whether it's for natural food regeneration or just to, to make that habitat safer for bigger fires, which I think we're all still trying to figure that out. And, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful that some of the things we can learn from our Native American friends will help the modern science views that um, understand and appreciate how fire can be, a, is a part of the landscape. It always has been, it always will be. But we've changed things from our our presence on that landscape that I think things have, have gotten out of control in many ways. So I think what people can do as they're recreating, as they're enjoying trip step, be careful. Don't start those fires that could turn into some really big disasters for people and wildlife. And, you know, help if you can in that process. We're trying to figure out the right way to apply fire to the landscape and support that and not, you know, People will get bent out of shape because there's smoke in the air. Well, there's a lot less smoke than when you get an uncontrolled fire that burns 400,000 acres in you know a couple of days. So um, you know that's a part of the process to have some smoke in the air. Just respect that. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to Ted for creating this amazing film. Thank you to all of you key speakers who are, have been here answering all these questions and for helping us all gain a little bit of perspective and appreciation for shrub sub habitat. I think that ends our time here. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, I hope you all have a, a safe rest of your week. Thank you all and we'll be sure to post this video to at least Conservation Northwest YouTube and get it over to the department as well in case anyone wants to tune in or was it or miss something that they weren't able to catch earlier in the discussion. Thank you. All right. Bye.